of the Apostle Peter, which is where he probably got most of his source uh, f- to write the Gospel of Mark. And um, most scholars date Mark uh, to around 80, somewhere between 80, 60, and 70. Um, but usually they say, well, it sh- probably has to be at least, the latest it could be is 80, 70. So around 40, 30 years after Jesus' life, he would have written all of this down. And, um, and Mark's account, um, and I'm going to keep this brief because just like Mark, Mark likes to keep sort of his uh, story sort of quite brief and quick. He, he wants to get through, uh, give you this, this is what happened and you, know, you need to think about why this happened and who Jesus is. And, and he moves through the book of Mark almost quite quickly. Uh, he, he doesn't like to use a lot of sort of like blocks of words. You don't really see a lot of, you know, the red letters you know, in your Bible sometimes. The, the Gospels might have red letters. Oh, this is what Jesus said. Mark is more, this is the story. You know, he said this, next story. He did this, he said this, next story. Um, that's sort of how he likes to go. And it's quite clear from the beginning that what he's really focused on is telling people or challenging people to think about who is this man that's doing these miracles, that's teaching these things, um, and, and you know who. And there's a there's a question in chapter four of Mark where uh, Jesus calms the storm, and and the question that the disciples have is who is this man? So it, that's the question really that Mark wants all of us to ask. And, and by the end of it, he wants us to get to this point where. Uh, when, he, when we see Jesus die, when we see him uh, rise again, we say, oh, he is the Messiah. Uh, he, he is the one he, who he said he was. All of these things that he did uh, had meaning apart from just what we could see on the outside as, oh, he healed someone or he was a good teacher. This guy was the son of man, and we'll sort of touch on what that might mean a little later on. Um, so, so he comes into this world, he brings the good news, he brings the kingdom, and all of these things about his teachings, his healings, um, his you know, casting out demons are, are all uh, symptoms or, or, or all sort of signs that the kingdom has come, and Jesus is the one who brings this kingdom. And ultimately, uh, hopefully we'll also see today that as he brings this sort of healing and this new kingdom, what he's really actually showing us is he brings this kingdom of a spiritual kingdom, of forgiveness, and through that, he redeems the whole world uh, in every way, um, and we are to see Jesus as God, the only one who can do that. Um, so that's really just a really short outline of what Mark wants us to see, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, catch that in our story today as well in Mark chapter 2. It's quite relevant. Who is this man that takes it upon himself to forgive sins. That sort of theme is what comes out in Mark chapter 2. So let's read uh, the Bible passage, and then I'll pray, and then we'll get started. So this is Mark chapter 2, just the first 12 verses. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get to get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. 
So my name is Stephen, uh, if you don't know me, uh, I'm an assistant here, um, and uh, I graduated uh, from Bible College or Theological College, was it this year? My graduation was this year, I think, so I finished my classes last year, um, and I've, um, I've heard this passage preached on, I think, over the years of you know, just being at church. Uh, multiple times, but one time that sort of sticks with me is, I think one of my colleagues, uh, you know, did a little sermon on this uh, in preaching class, and um, his mother had actually died a few years previously to cancer, and um, what he said as he preached this passage just sort of stayed with me. He said, uh, you know, God didn't answer his prayers for his mum to be healed of cancer. But what he did know is that she believed in Jesus. And so she received the greatest gift of all, which was to be forgiven in Christ. And that sort of has remained with me. And and when I read this, that's sort of what I think about. So this is a passage that could really change how you view your life. It it, it, It affected how my friend viewed his mother's death. Um, and what was really uh, meaningful for him as he thought about his mum who died to cancer. So this could be something that is important for all of us too. And uh, I want to go through today's passage by sort of dealing with three questions, three questions that might come up as we read through this story. Um, And we'll we'll touch on the questions as we go, but um, it would be astonishing for us to imagine... Uh, Two things, really. First of all, a room packed with people trying to hear about Jesus. Uh, That sounds a little difficult to to imagine. Um, And second of all, if it was packed, that people would be lowering, you know, putting a hole in the roof, trying to get that. And if, if, if that happened right now, I'm sure we'd be all very surprised. We'd be very uh, speechless and focused on that. And so this is what happens. Jesus is preaching. Uh, there's no space. So people put a hole in the roof and, and bring this paralyzed man down on a mat. And um, they, they, they would have heard the stories about Jesus, right? They're, they're, not, they're doing this because they've heard about Jesus. They've heard about how he's been driving out these demons, how he's been healing people, he's been healing lepers. And and it's not just one or two people. Wherever he goes, people, crowds were following him. They were bringing all the sick, and Jesus was healing them. So he, they've heard about Jesus. And they bring this paralyzed man. Maybe he's their friend or family member. And when they lower this man uh, before Jesus, what do you think they were expecting Jesus to do? Obviously, they were expecting Jesus to heal him. They'd heard about what Jesus could do. But instead, when Jesus sees them, and he sees the man, we're told, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. You can imagine if something like that happened today, if we go to a doctor, if if we go to a minister, and we say, look, you know, Glenn, look, I have this sort of issue, like, and I really need help. And he said, "Uh, your your, your sins are forgiven. You'd think, yeah, thanks, but... You know, I, I do, like, I, I, that's not why I came to you. I, I, can't you see that I, I need help with something? And you can imagine someone saying to Jesus today, Jesus, I didn't come to you for my sins to be forgiven. Can't you see that I have some, something more immediate? Can't you see that there's something in my life that, I, that you need to fix that, that's really uh, urgent before you talk about my sins? I didn't ask for forgiveness. I asked for healing. So, why does Jesus choose to forgive this man's sins when he actually came to be healed? Well, Jesus is saying, your most important need, your deepest need, and even your most immediate need It's actually not physical. It's spiritual. Your most immediate need, your deepest need, is spiritual. Your deepest need is not to be healed of your physical disability. 
but to be healed of your spiritual one. Look, if you believe your deepest need is physical, then um, to you, health, um, long life, uh, a comfortable life, maybe even wealth, are the most important things to you. And so your greatest enemy would be getting old. Your greatest enemy would be feeling weak. Uh, and if that is your greatest enemy, then you're fighting a losing battle. You're fighting a battle that you can never win. All the science and money and even exercise and healthy food won't help you. It, it ultimately won't help you. It won't save you. But if you're, and if your deepest need is, 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 is social, yeah, I guess young kids use this word, social clout, right? social uh, capital, then your friendships, your marriage, uh, whether people like you or not, if that's the most important thing to you, anytime someone doesn't like you, anytime your friendships are strained or your marriage isn't going well, your spouse isn't happy with you, that's what will destroy you. If your deepest need is to be affirmed in your sexual preference, and anyone who denies that is a bigot and needs to be cancelled, if you think your deepest need is to get justice for, for abuse, even abuse directed at you or inequality or discrimination, you'll actually be bitter for the rest of your life. Often we think, if I could just fix this one part of my life, if I could get this right, or if God could do this thing for me, then everything would be okay. But we all know that's not true. Because whenever we get anything, there's always the next thing. So Jesus says, the only way to ultimately beat injustice, to beat abuse, to, to nurture healthy relationships, to be emotionally stable, to find peace, is actually to experience the forgiveness of Christ. That's our deepest need. Because to be forgiven in Jesus means, means that you have to face the fact that and these, these are the words of Tim Keller, you are more sinful and flawed than you ever dared believe, and yet at the same time more accepted and loved than you ever dared hope. You're more sinful and flawed than you ever dared believe, and at the same time more accepted and loved than you ever dared hope. So until we can both be completely humbled, and yet also wonderfully affirmed and loved, until then, we'll always be a prisoner to this feeling that it's never enough. We're, we will always feel inferior. We'll always feel uh, like a failure. We'll, we'll feel anger. We'll feel bitterness for, for the fact that we can't get to what we want. Or if we do get what we want, then either we'll find that we are deeply unsatisfied because it's the next thing, or... We find that uh, we may even become the abuser who will bulldoze through anyone who gets in the way of, getting, uh, of our reaching what we think is our deepest need. The answer to that, so the only answer to, to, to beating this feeling of failure, to beating this feeling of uh, dissatisfaction, to actually nurturing relationships that are healthy and keep you healthy is by realizing that our deepest need is not what we decide. Our deepest need is for forgiveness. And only Jesus can give us this forgiveness. And Jesus tells, shows this paralyzed man what you need right now is not your physical disability to be healed. What you need is for your sin to be forgiven. So in Jesus' time, people uh, took it for granted that um, there was a connection between uh, sin and sickness. If someone was sort of, you know, was sick or um, had suffered an injury or was born a certain way, there was sort of this assumption that Oh, well, they're being punished for some sort of sin. And um, if, if, 
If we said that today, if someone came to church and came to me and um, they were unwell or their family member was unwell, they're going through something really difficult, we probably wouldn't say to them, you know what, uh, it's probably because like, you know, you haven't been coming to church regularly or, you know, or you, did you read your Bible this morning? Oh yeah, maybe that's why you should go. Like, you wouldn't say that. Uh, it, it, it's too simplistic almost. And um, because if, and if that were true, that every bad thing that happens in our life is simply a direct result of, oh, you did this wrong on Tuesday, so on, by Thursday you're going to find out what God thinks about it. Then the way that, uh, the, then it would be an easy solution for us to, do every, to undo every unfortunate event in our life. All we'd have to do is, okay, let's just find out what I did wrong, and I'll tell God that, oh yeah, sorry, uh, I shouldn't have done that, and he'll make my life better again. And of course, brokenness and sin and suffering and sadness in our life is a result of sin. And God uses certain events to make us think about whether we really are walking in step with God. And I, I, God does and can use uh, evil, bad, to lead us to him. But the Bible also tells us that sickness or disability or suffering is not necessarily a result of sin. And um, there's a, the book of Job is dedicated to that. And we know in the Gospel of John, when people bring a man that was born blind to Jesus and they say, well, why is he blind? Was it this guy's fault? Was it his sin or his parents' sin? And Jesus says, it was neither his sin. This happens so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So, so we're not, I don't think we're supposed to take this story of this lame, or this paralyzed man coming down and being forgiven of his sins as, yeah, Jesus knew that there was something really wrong in his life and he had to forgive him first. That's not what this story is trying to tell us. Jesus tells, Jesus tells his paralyzed man that his sins are forgiven he satisfies his deepest need because he knows that's what he needs. And the interesting thing is he actually does it even though the man doesn't ask for it. And I think that's, that, that should be our second question as we read through this story. When we read this story and we, and we think, okay, if Jesus didn't forgive this man because he thought he needed to be forgiven to be healed, that was his problem, uh, your actual problem um, to be here. Like, you know, you, you're, you're, you're paralyzed because you haven't been forgiven. That's not what Jesus is saying because the guy doesn't ask to be forgiven uh, and he doesn't come with this idea that Oh, I need to be forgiven so that I can be healed. He just comes to Jesus. And our second question, how can Jesus forgive this man even though he doesn't ask for it? Um, we need, there, there's two clues in this story as to why Jesus and how Jesus can forgive this man even though he doesn't repent. And the first is that Jesus sees his faith in verse 5. He sees their faith and he responds to that. And the second uh, is in verse 8. There's a clue in verse 8 where we're told that Jesus knew what these teachers of the law were thinking. And so uh, he obviously knew what was in the paralyzed man's heart. He knew what was in the scribe's heart. So I don't know what exactly Jesus saw in the man. Um, because all Mark tells us is that this man was paralyzed and he had four friends who helped him come to Jesus. Um, and yeah, he was lowered through the roof, but he's not the only one who made a great effort to come to see Jesus. And it's pretty clear that I don't think he understood who Jesus was. I don't think he quite understood exactly who Jesus was, like we might think, oh yeah, Jesus, yeah, come to Jesus, be forgiven. I don't think he knew that. And it's also clear that the man didn't have the right words to say. In fact, Mark Tell, pretty much tells us he didn't really say anything at all. He just lowered to the roof. All it says is this man came to Jesus 
and Jesus saw their faith. And this is really important because God doesn't forgive us because we beg for his forgiveness. God doesn't forgive us because we add please at the end. There's no mantra. There's no... God doesn't decide whether to forgive us or not based on how good we are at repenting, whether we say the right words or not. He doesn't forgive us because we list every single thing we do wrong. Because, I mean, do you go to Jesus knowing exactly what you'll say all the time? Do you go to Jesus in full knowledge of what exactly you did wrong and your sins before God? I don't think so because, and if you do think so, I think you'd be in for a very big surprise because if we were confronted with all of our sinfulness, all the things that God sees that we don't, we would be speechless. It's like, you know, um, it's like if I vacuum the house and I think, oh yeah, I did a pretty good job. And then my mom comes and <laughs> she looks at the job that I've done. She'll be like, this is, this is disgusting. See, in my eyes... Yeah, oh, pretty clean, not bad. But in the eyes of someone who actually knows, in the eyes of God who knows everything, we would all be speechless at how dirty we actually are. So that's why the Bible says, in Romans 8, even though we don't have the words to say exactly what it is we need to say to Jesus, Jesus knows. Jesus sees this man's heart. Not that this man was holy, not that this man was particularly righteous, but that this man came to Jesus knowing that all he had was Jesus. Verse 26, Romans 8, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And I think until we can uh, really reach this point where we say, look, yeah, you know, there are times where I'm overwhelmed. I don't even know what to say. That's the time, I think, where we are really most vulnerable before God. To say, look, God, I just, I don't know. I need you to tell me what to say what to think, what to do. And you know, Jesus is so willing and he's so ready to forgive this man, isn't he? He, he wasn't waiting for this man to say the magic word. He wasn't just staying, you know, staring at this man as he was hanging from the ceiling and saying, yeah, I'm waiting, like, what, do you, what do you want from me? He knew exactly what the man needed. And that's the wonder, I think, of, of grace. God's grace extends to the unworthy and even to the unexpecting. God makes his own opportunity to forgive this man, even though the man simply came to him for healing. He didn't ask for forgiveness. He didn't go expecting to meet God, he just went to Jesus with a need and Jesus gives him much more than what he came to ask for. And that's what grace is. God knows exactly who we are, where we are, what we've done. He knows our need better than ourselves and God's grace is so unbel unbelievably great that he gives us more than we ever deserve or ask for. Let's move to the final point, and I'm going to read from verse 6 down to 12. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take a mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. 
So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. And he got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. So here are these teachers of the law and they're thinking, and I think they're thinking correctly, how can a man say your sons are forgiven? How can a human say to someone else, your sons, your sins are forgiven unless that man had done something wrong to him. Did this man sin against Jesus? No, he didn't do anything wrong against the man Jesus. So how can Jesus forgive his sin? We, we all know if, 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 if you know, something happens between you know, me and, I don't know, my wife, and you know, we have a fight, and is it right of uh, someone else to come and say, Stephen, your sins are forgiven? No, it's Angelina's job to tell me I'm forgiven. So the Jewish teachers are absolutely right to be shocked because if Jesus is claiming that he's able to forgive sins, then Jesus is claiming that all sin is against him. Which is extraordinary because it tells us all injustice, all the wrongdoing in our lives, all the abuse, all evil, even all sickness is ultimately not an offense against you or me. It's an, effect, it's an offense against God. God is the creator and sustainer of the world. God owns you. He made you. All sin is an offense against God before it's an offense against me and you. All the things that you have gone through before it makes you angry makes God angry. And this is extremely comforting because God is the only one who is perfectly holy and perfectly just. He's the only one who can achieve true justice. But it's also extremely humbling because we have to remove ourselves from being the victim. This mentality, and I think it's very prevalent in today's society where if you perceive yourselves to be the victim or if you can paint yourself to be the victim, you can almost get away with anything. You're allowed to uh, abuse your abuser by playing the victim. And but if all sin is against God, then you can't do that. So Jesus is claiming that if all sin is against God and he says, your, I, I'm going to tell you that your sins are forgiven, he's claiming to be God, and which is astounding. Um, how can a man claim to be God? And instead of saying, you know, take it or leave it, you know, you believe me or I'm out of here, Jesus says this, what's easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or get up, take your mat and walk. And, you know, when you read that at face value, it's quite obvious that it's much easier to say to someone, your sins are forgiven, than get up and take your mat and walk. If there was a man here who came to us and said, look, I really, you know, heal me of my paralysis. What's easier to say to him? You know, hey, you know, God loves you, you'll be okay. Or, hey, yeah, okay, get up and, you know, go home and walk. Obviously, it's easier to say, you know, God loves you, your sins are forgiven, because you can't prove it. You don't have to prove it then and there. If you say, get up, take your mat and walk, you're saying, yeah, I'm going to heal you right here, right now. That's an extraordinary thing. But the teachers of the law found no issue with Jesus healing people. They, they, weren't, they weren't, you know, they, that's not what they were caught up on. To them, it was a much, much bigger deal, a much harder thing for Jesus to say, your sins are forgiven. And I think that's Mark's point. Yes, it seems easy to say your sins are forgiven, but really, it's much, much harder. 
It's a much, much bigger thing to say that your sins are forgiven. Because that's something only God can do. You know, it's a much easier thing for us to believe in a man named Jesus who uh, can heal our sicknesses, who can make us feel good, who can uh, get us that new job or that new car or you know, give us a child or give us a baby or make us happy and you know, uh, give me my dream house and a happy family. It's much easier to believe in a Jesus who can do that than it is to believe in a Jesus who tells us that he owns our lives and to follow him means denying ourselves. It's much easier to believe that Jesus is a Jesus who will just give us what we want when we want than a Jesus who tells us, no, you live how I want. And it's also a much harder thing for Jesus to say your sins are forgiven because we have to remember what is the price that Jesus pays to tell this man his sins are forgiven. God forgives sin, but he also punishes every sin. How does Jesus forgive sins? Does he just say, oh, hey, your sins, you know, you know, you know it's like Oprah. Hey, you get a... You get a car, you get a car, hey, you get a car. Yeah, Jesus does that. He, he's more generous than Oprah. But you know how he pays for his generosity in forgiving sins? He pays with his own life. Jesus forgives our sins by taking the punishment for sins on himself by going to the cross. He uses his authority to forgive, and he takes the justice on himself. So it's a much, much harder thing for Jesus to say, your sins are forgiven. Because the price for that is his own life. And that's the power of forgiveness, and that's why it has to be Jesus. Who can forgive sins? Jesus alone. He has authority to forgive not only because he is God, but because he's God who pays for sin with his own life. He not only forgives, but he enacts justice. And he rises again to show us sin could not hold him. He has defeated sin. He's the son of man, the one who's given authority and glory and power in an everlasting kingdom, but he brings the kingdom not with violence, not with this, hey, I'm God, listen to me, or else. He brings it by the authority of forgiveness, of mercy, of healing. You know, we are happy to have a Jesus who deals with you know, all the needs that we say is important, but we're probably much less happy to have a Jesus who tells us to deal with what he says is important. Is important. Uh, because if we believe that, it means we have to admit that we aren't as good as we think we are, we aren't as smart as we think we are, we aren't as in control as we'd like to be, and um, we have to confess that we don't actually know what we need, um, nor can we achieve it by our own strength. And, now, and Jesus says, your deepest need is not to be good, uh, it's not to be smart, it's not to be in control, it's not even always to say the right things or be religious uh, as you can, your deepest need is to actually find that you aren't all those things. Your deepest need is to be humbled and then also affirmed in who you are and who Jesus is making you to be because Jesus has forgiven you. Jesus heals the man. He ends up healing the man as well. But he only does it so that people would know, that readers would know, that Jesus has the power not only to heal physical sicknesses, but to heal the spiritual sickness, the sickness that ails all of us. And if you are forgiven, if your spiritual condition is taken care of, then you are truly free to love and forgive others. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus, and um, we thank you that he saw through um, 
the, the need of the paralyzed man. Um, and he chose to give this paralyzed man more than he ever asked for. We thank you that in the same way you know our needs and you, you tell us that our actual need is spiritual. We need to be right with you and flowing on from that. Uh, we can r- truly live in the way that you want us to and truly live in a way that we don't, we're not being tossed here and there by our emotions or by um, bitterness or um, or by self-worth, uh, but instead we, we're grounded in who you say we are. You, you humble us and yet you also affirm how much you love us, even to the point that you would die for us. You would do the hard thing and die for us on the cross. We thank you for that. And we ask that you'd help us as well as we uh, look to Jesus and as we um, understand the gospel, that we would also do the hard thing um, to forgive to come to you to uh, to ask you to take care of our deepest need before we think about how you can give us um, help for our more uh, physical or emotional or social needs. And we know that when we come to you, you do care about these things. Just as you healed this uh, paralyzed man, um, you are also healing us in every way. And we look forward to the day when Jesus returns. He restores and redeems all things so that there is no more weeping and uh, crying and pain and sickness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ever I loved thee.